Welcome back. So we are on to our first actual empire, right? We've been talking about Greece so far. Um, so the Roman Empire, uh, you may have heard of it, right? Uh, huge topic, right? Spanned from uh, the hundreds BC up through in the Western Empire through the 400-ish AD, right? And then there was the Eastern Roman Empire, which kept going um, right up in the renaissance <clears throat> so uh we can't cover it in any detail right you could people spend their whole careers just studying one you know particular part of rome but hopefully this is sort of a <clears throat> for those of you that aren't familiar uh an introduction right to the broad history of the roman empire and uh its nature and then we will touch on some of the overarching themes of the course about what were the strategies Right, that Rome used so, so that we can then, you know, compare it to other empires in China and, and elsewhere. So Rome was certainly not the first empire in history by any means. <clears throat> um, empires have existed almost as long as recorded history has existed. Uh, here, right, this image is of some ancient empires around 1450 BC. I mean, empires uh, date back to, you know, maybe the Sumerians, 4,000 BC, depending on how you de define empire. Uh, so they've been around for a long time. Here we have, you know, Assyria, the Hittites, Babylonia, right, the Egyptians all um, against each other uh, for thousands of years. Um, we studied, we looked at the Greeks, right? There was a Greek empire that was after the period that we talked about, uh, the period of Alexander the Great. Uh, relatively short-lived only lasted about as long as alexander himself after he died it sort of fragmented but uh it spanned uh, <clears throat> the entire greece and the entire middle east right and he even made it as far as india. um there were empires in india africa asia right? so we can't possibly touch on all empires um but we are going to talk about the roman and chinese roman and chinese imperial empires and um they were just exceptionally long-lived and exceptionally influential. We still um, talk about these empires, and they still, um, in many ways, influence the nature of, of our political organization. Um, so they, whatever they were doing, it was, uh, to a large degree, successful, right? And if you're thinking about what makes an empire successful and why do they fail, um, Rome is definitely worth taking a look at. It would be hard to... Uh, teach a course in empire without talking about Rome. So the Roman Empire began in first century BC. Uh, so again, that's zero to 100, right? The first towards uh, negative, right? Negative 100 to zero. Um, and it expanded to cover basically the entire Mediterranean area. Mediterranean area. So here on the map, you see the Mediterranean. So it's um, you got Spain on the west, and then sort of Turkey on the east, Africa to the south, right, and Italy and Greece kind of right smack in the middle of it. Uh, so it covered that whole area and more, right? It's it actually reached as far north as England, right? So the Romans did colonize uh, Britain. Um, Western Empire fell around the 400s A.D. The Eastern Roman Empire uh, centered more around Turkey, uh, continued until the 1400s AD. And, you know, even at its height, people were very aware that this was something special, right? Um, they asked the same sort of questions we're asking now. How could a single state become so enormous and so powerful? And, you know, the answer to that question is complicated. One obvious piece of it is location, right? So circling the entire mediterranean this is since biblical times been an important area for trade um and if you can dominate right that area you can really dominate the economic life of a large part of the known world at that time um but you know rome was not the first uh state to try to accomplish that um other states had tried so what why was it R rome Right, that did manage to conquer the Mediterranean and not say Egypt or Carthage, right, the Rome's main competitor in its um, early years. 
So maybe we can answer that question. What made Rome so successful in you know bits and pieces throughout the course of this lecture? Maybe there might maybe you might have your own ideas, right? You might want to write a term paper about it. Um, but we'll begin at the beginning. So you know, with these ancient civilizations, much of their origins are shrouded in the mythology that they told about themselves. Not if any of which is true, but certainly uh, Rome began as like a small kingdom somewhere on the east or on the east coast of Italy. Uh, their story about their origins is in the Aeneid, which is this mythical account of the founder of Rome, Aeneas. Uh, he factors in, so <clears throat> if you've heard of the Iliad and the Odyssey, right, maybe you've read them at some point in your college career. These are the story, this is the story of the Trojan War, right, of the Achaeans against the Trojans um, to rescue Helen of Troy. Uh, and so on, or to, yeah, going back. Um, and uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey are told more or less from the side of the Achaeans. And then uh, the Romans claim their founder to be on the side of the Trojans. So the Trojans were like in Turkey, um, and the Achaeans were coming from Greece. Uh, so Aeneas, like Odyssey, so the Odyssey is Odysseus after the Trojan War, trying to get back home and going through all these trials and tribulations. And the Aeneid is a similar story about Aeneas, right, and his voyage uh, after the Trojan War. And eventually, after all these interesting stories and encounters with gods and monsters and so on, he ends up in uh, in Italy and found, according to the story. There's <clears throat> also a story of Romulus, who's supposed to be the first king of Rome. So you may have heard Romulus and Remus. He had a brother, they're twins, uh, right? They're abandoned as children and nursed by a mother wolf. So this uh, sculpture is of that. So, you know, there's no way to know if that's true, but at any rate, those are the, uh, the myths. And they're interesting if you ever get a chance to, to read the Aeneid or more about mythical stories. They're always So as I said, Rome originated as a small kingdom, and, and this uh, gif here sort of shows the growth. Um, we'll see in a moment, it'll go back to uh, the beginning here. So a little spot right on the east coast of Italy, and it grows, and by negative 40, it's pretty much covered the Mediterranean, right? By that's So at like 500 BC, so at the very be early, um, the Romans replaced their king with the Republic. And the Republic existed for most of Rome's expansion, right? Uh, by about 27 BC at the time, Julius Caesar kind of became de facto emperor and then his son became officially emperor, right, Augustus. Uh, so that's when it changed into a, from a Republic to like an, an empire with an emperor, right? Although it was already a Republican empire before that. Um, but at that point it was already huge. So oh, this initial expansion, right, uh, first job was just to take over Italy. And there were lots of different tribes, lots of different kingdoms uh, in Italy. So there were some Etruscans, which were kind of considered the, the oldest, sort of most uh, distinguished uh, civilization there. Um, there were some Gauls. So Gauls is sort of the word for French people, right? Um, tribes from north of Italy, which is France other Latin tribes. So Rome was a, a Latin tribe. There were even some Greeks in there. And they had to take all of those kingdoms over in order to start to become an empire. Um, Romans had an impressive military strategy. The book doesn't, you know, you could do a whole history class focused on military strategy. Uh, this course does not. But I like to throw it in here and there where I can. It's important to the expansion of Rome. Uh, they had an incredibly effective military, and there are a few reasons for that. So initially, they adopted the phalanx formation, uh, which I talked about a bit when we talked about the Greek city-states. So Greek hoplites. So this here is a Roman phalanx, but the, a, a Greek phalanx would have looked quite similar, right? And they're, but as they're standing very close together, shoulder to shoulder, shields in front, shields on top. Um, and then they would have these long spears so they could advance more or less invulnerable to arrows, right? The people were shooting from a distance so they could get up very close and they could stab you with these long spears like a big armored porcupine. 
Um, so Romans started that. They developed it and, and altered it and, and changed it to different formations. They also had cavalry and things like this, right? Um, Romans were also excellent engineers. So they would march, march, march all day, right? And then before they went to bed, they would work, 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 build trenches, wooden forts, all these defenses. If they had to build a bridge to cross the river, they would build the bridge. And seemingly overnight, a whole city would sprout out, sprout up at the end of their march. And they were now completely defended right, wherever they sat down to sleep. Um, there were really no, no one else could compete in that area. And then also just organizationally, the Roman soldiers were professionals. So remember the Greek hoplites, it was you and your neighbor and the fellow, the, the plumber down the street, right? All got together to, to fight a war real quick, right? The Romans were trained, experienced fighters. They did this for a living uh, day in and day out and were paid for it. So in becoming a republic and taking power out of the hands of a single king, Romans became uh, less a state of powerful men and a state governed by laws. So they had two heads of state, two consuls. This was deliberate so that one person wouldn't get too much power. And there were other magistrates and the laws were determined by the citizens. So magistrates could make proposals for laws, but in order for the law to become a in order for the proposal to become a law, it had to be voted on by an assembly of all the citizens, right? Um, the assembly also conducted trials. So if you, right, where you, you were charged with some crime, it was, you know, again, your peers that were deciding whether or not to convict you. Now, of course, as usual in the ancient world, women and slaves didn't count as citizens. And as in Greece, there were different classes of citizens, right? We saw that, uh, and so long created different classes to balance right the interest of the wealthy with while keep making sure that the lower classes didn't revolt right and, and the similar dynamic um, existed in rome so similar to the greek system there were certain offices that were reserved for people in the upper classes so if you're in the lowest class right you couldn't become uh you know, a consul or something like that but uh it did work, right? It did prevent one person from becoming too powerful and having, you know, what the Greeks would call a tyrant and uh, what the Romans would call a king. They were very averse to kings um, in their Republican period. And, you know, is this part of their success, right? Uh, early, right, in the United States and when we were forming our government, we definitely were thinking about the Romans um, and their republic and the benefits of that form of government. And, and we saw some, you know, there is some empirical evidence that democratized decision making is more accurate than, you know, your empire has to make decisions and you'd like to make accurate decisions. So uh, rather than right, vesting everything into a single person, I mean, the empirical evidence showed that groups of people are even right, more accurate than experts. So imagine if you're dealing with a king who happens to be the son of the son of somebody who managed to gain political power, but is now you know, rich and lazy and kind of stupid, right? Yeah, a, you know, kingship is is a is a real hit or miss kind of uh, situation. Right? You have to, like Aristotle said, if you have a really good king, it can work out well. Uh, you're flip, you're rolling the dice every time with every successive king, and and they're not all going to be good. So democracy, some you know, the republic is is likely part of the reason, right? Why we're in So being a citizen and being in the military went hand in hand for the Rome. Uh, even this term imperium, from which we get the term empire, originally referred to the, the old kings, like before the Republic, the king had this right to impose capital punishment on people and to draft them into the military. Uh, and he, after they got rid of the kings, they kept that right and passed it on to the consuls, right? So the, the idea of, the military and the law and the rights of the citizens were kind of wrapped up with each other. The original voting districts and the military and the original military units were the same people. Right? So these are called centuries. It means a group of a hundred. So again, all, not unlike Greece, right? You, right, your century, or at least originally, was like all the folks in your neighborhood who all voted at the same, right, uh, courthouse also were in the same military unit together.
um, as Rome expanded, right, the military became more professional. So there was a group of sort of aristocrats who could trace their lineage back to their original tribes from the early days of Rome. And this sort of prestige uh, stuck with them even to the re Republican period. And these people were called tribunes. And then the newer citizens, right, who couldn't trace their lineage back that far, who had, you know, immigrated or whatever, uh, these were called the plebs. And so these were distinct group voting groups, right? So, I mean, roughly kind of sort of analogous, like the Senate and the House in the U.S., right? They're, they're both just groups of people that vote on stuff, but they're kind of kept separate. Sort of similar thing in Rome between the tribunes and the plebs. And they allowed for certain checks, checks and balances on each other. So Rome was doing well. They were expanding, right? They were taking over Italy and, and, and going further and further, ultimately going to take over the entire Mediterranean area. Uh, that's a whole different right, ball of wax from just being a local kingship or even a local republic. You need strategies for governing larger and larger empire. So the office of praetor was invented. So this was sort of a governor of a con conquered territory. You would run. So, you know, I conquer a an area in northern Italy and I install a praetor over there to run the territory. Now, the the territories sort of very near to Rome in the early days, uh, they were just kind of annexed and all of the free males just became citizen, Roman citizens. So Rome just expanded a bit and they didn't have to rule those neighbors with really heavy hand, right? There were certain benefits to becoming uh, ends of this right larger, more powerful city, and so they didn't have to necessarily install a praetor in their nearby um, neighborhoods. Uh, but the new citizens, just like other Roman citizens, would have to serve in the military, right? They would have to integrate themselves into the Roman culture. But in further away territory, right, as you get further away geographically and culturally, often they had to make different arrangements. Um, the cult, you know, you conquer your neighbors, you're not going to have too much trouble with language, right, or different gods or different cultures. The further away you get, uh, you, it's going to be harder and harder to force right, dolls to learn Latin and to worship your gods and so on. So often, locals were local leaders were just given a fair amount of autonomy so look you're part of rome now but you can keep your position just you know pay your taxes and don't fight us right play play along with our overall military plans and things will be just fine and, and so sometimes a closer right hand a stricter approach worked and sometimes a looser approach worked depending on the story Sometimes Rome would send colonists, so they would conquer a territory and then send a bunch of Romans over there to sort of settle it, right? Or it may have already been populated, but a bunch of Romans over there to make it Roman and to, to run it and to convert it to a sort of a, a Roman vibe, if you will, right? So um, this is often attractive to people, right? A, an opportunity to colonize a new area is an opportunity to sort of start afresh in a new place, get some free land, you know, less competition. Uh, you know, you can go to a new colony where if you're a craftsman, right, if you're a, someone who, right, makes great pots, they don't have many pots there, you could maybe do really well there instead of sticking around Rome where every other person, right, pottery or, or whatever, right, whatever the craft is. Uh, so this, this was an attractive uh, opportunity for some people, um, and it was a good way for Rome to, keep control over conquered territories. If you seed them with Romans, you know, that are loyal to Rome and have Roman culture, then you don't have to worry quite as much as as soon as you, right, move part of your army away, they're just going to flip back. Whoever is just going to flip back to whatever they were doing before. Um, to become a colonist, sometimes you had to give up your Roman citizenship and become a citizen of the new colony, but, you know, often it was worth, the economic benefit was worth that trade. And uh, so 
and oh, this picture is of a just kind of a standard Roman colony. What they did is they kind of had a standard city plan that they would just they would move colonists there and start building. So they would do these perpendicular intersecting streets, these grid sort of plans. You know, depending on the size of the colony, they'd build they might build a coliseum, right? They'd build uh, a library, right? Areas for public different public works, and they kind of build the same thing over and over, right? So, the if you travel much um, you'll often encounter areas that were once a roman town and you'll see often some of the same types of buildings uh, so by the time Il rome had conquered all of italy right which is still relatively early right they've got a lot farther to go these three basic imperial repertoires were in place right? so they would offer a kind of citizenship to the conquered people sometimes a limited kind of citizenship or they might offer a degree of autonomy to the conquered people, or they'd send colonists in to sort of spread the Roman culture. And Roman citizenship was worth it, right? It was coveted. And, and in fact, often many of the people in Italy that they conquered eventually uh, sort of demanded citizenship right? that weren't offered it immediately and, and eventually won citizenship because it citizenship meant you could vote, right? Uh, it meant you could get married uh, uh, legally, you could own land, you could pass that property down to your children. So um, Roman citizens definitely had a chance to right, enrich themselves and their families and get established in a way that was sort of off if you weren't. So <clears throat> Rome is expanding, but they, they butt up against uh, another important uh, uh, proto empire right at the same time, which is North African Empire. Um, they were, this is, we're talking 264 to 146 BC here, um, where we get into what we call the Punic Wars, which were the wars with Carthage. They were kind of on again, off again, right? They, were, they weren't battling that entire time. Uh, but it was a long, right, about a, over a century of uh, struggle. And by the end of it, Rome won, and they controlled the entire Mediterranean. And you know, economic, uh, that's an economic slam dunk, right? Be able to control the trade over that entire area is just that's now you're a, a real empire. So, Carthage was a Phoenician state. So, Phoenicians, they if you've read like the Bible, the Old Testament, all Phoenicians, well, up, I think the Canaanites were probably Phoenicians. That you know, so in the story of the Bible, right, the um, the Jews leave. Egypt, right? Uh, and then they, they're they wandering for a while, and then they take over Canaan, and that becomes Israel, right? So that was Phoenician territory that they took over. Uh, the Philistines, maybe, I think, have been thought to be Phoenicians, so Goliath, right? But anyways, the Phoenicians were like a seafaring people. They've been around since ancient time, sailing around the Mediterranean, trading, and so on. And so Carthage was ethnically Phoenician, located in North Africa, and, you know, looking to control the same Mediterranean trade route. So they, the fight started over uh, Sicily and it just kind of kept going and kept going. So the, the big players there were the Roman general Scipio and then the Carthaginian commander Hannibal. Right? Um, There's a famous incident of Hannibal leading an army over the Alps, right, to, to battle the Romans with, uh, and he's got elephants in his army, right? So that's a picture of him striking visual of ancient warfare right you could have an army with elephants right who knew um but eventually rome won and in fact the only one of the elephants made it over the alps right the elephants weren't a great thing uh so rome kept expanding took over spain greece turkey france so getting bigger and bigger and as i said england right so how <clears throat> How did the government work exactly? So in, in one of these colonies, you know, say say Spain or, or, or Greece or whatever, the praetor of that area typically had total control over that territory. And the staff was fairly small. They didn't have a lot of bureaucracy going on. They had their family, they had their slaves, maybe a few other officials. And really all their job was, was to keep trade going, right? Keep taxes flowing and, keep this economy pumping. Uh, 
and to make sure that there was military presence to keep order if order needed to be kept. Um, and there are a lot of different ways that they could accomplish that. And ideally, they could accomplish it without, if they could accomplish it without interfering too much in the way of life of the conquered people. And if overall the conquered people eventually kind of felt better off, right, as Romans, then, then great. That's like the cheapest way to run an empire, right? It's just to keep everybody paid and keep everybody happy and not have to constantly have a huge military presence. Uh, sometimes local elites, so you, you know, you take over an area, but it doesn't mean you slaughter the whole population and, you know, you want to cozy up to the people that are already in charge, make it worth their while to go along with this whole Roman thing. So sometimes that meant giving them citizenships, uh, you know, keeping them on board with the program. And there were actually different legal systems for the Roman citizens and the, and the locals. So. If the locals, you know, if one steals from another, right, if one Gaul, if one Gaul steals from another Gaul and they want to sort it out in their own courts according to their own laws, the Romans would say, have it, do your thing, right? Now, if there was a conflict between a Rome, and then again, if a Roman steals from another Roman, then their conflict would be dealt with in according to Roman law, right, in the Roman court. Uh, of course, difficulties arise when you have a conflict between a Roman and a Gaul, right? But um, in general, there was this sort of legal pluralism. Um, and there's a lot of work for lawyers so that if you are a law student, right, you often much of law sort of in many ways looks back to Rome because Rome was sort of the, one of the birthplaces of lawyeries, right? So eventually Rome did get an M. Right. So, again, it's still a republic at this point, but it's growing and it's growing, right? There's more at stake. And having an empire this large as a republic starts to become unmanageable. So part of the problem was that Roman law was kind of mostly a folk law, right? So it wasn't so much written down uh, in, in in a clear code, right? But it's customs that they had right but the thing with those sorts of customs is the way you decide uh, a lot of issues right when you can't point to an exact uh, right legal standard is you wrangle you make deals somebody can afford a better lawyer than another and so on um there's a lot of gray area but the thing with that gray area is that it allows for uh people to sort of make power grabs, right? And sort of jostle, if you got a good lawyer, for, for more and more, more power, right? More authority and so on. And, and this was accentuated by the fact that, again, citizenship and service in the military went hand in hand. So even like the richest, most powerful citizens were also off at war, right? Leading armies and conquering and bringing back slaves right, and riches and so on. And so that means that many of the most powerful people are out of town, leaving a power vacuum, right, for people to come into. So the lack of like a strict sort of hierarchical system and all this gray area, while it was more democratic, was also a little more chaotic. And what ended up happening is people started killing each other as a means of political advancement. And once assassination started to be kind of a standard thing you did, if you wanted to get ahead, uh, the situation started to spin out of control really quickly. Uh, so it was in this period that Julius Caesar managed to take power, right? His, he brought his armies in. Remember, he controlled a large army. He was a, an incredibly successful general at first. And there was all this chaos in Rome. And he eventually he took his army Right, marched it over the Rubicon into Rome and says, okay, I'm taking over. Right? And, and he managed to do it. So now Julius Caesar is in control of Rome. He never strict, he never called himself an emperor, right? He called himself like a citizen, something like that. And, you know, because emperor, kings, they, they still left a bad taste in people's mouths, even, you know, hundreds of years after the, uh, that they've, they've been a republic. But he was effectively an emperor. He was the supreme ruler, right? And then he was eventually assassinated. Uh, and it's a little picture of the uh, 
the murder of Caesar. And it was so then his rule passed to his adopted son, Octavian, who became changed his name to Augustus and also called himself an emperor. Right. Uh, the term was pretty bad at that point. But officially, they had an empire 27 BC. Right. They officially, they had an emperor 27 BC, Emperor Augustus, son of Caesar. So this time of the early times of the emperors was actually a pretty good time for Rome. Uh, it was relatively peaceful. So Augustus had a pretty long life. He lived for 41 years, uh, you know, given all the constant assassinations that had been going on before. Pretty impressive. And it sort of put an end to all of that chaos. So there's a long period of peace. And his son Tiberius also had a nice uh, date sort of rule, right? So the Pax Romana, right? It was just a peaceful time. And that was kind of lucky, right? Because that gave everybody the sense that, all right, Rome's an empire now. Things are going pretty well. It's okay that we're not a republic anymore. Maybe it's even better. We're okay with it. And this also allowed more and more power to gradually accrue to the position of empire. Remember, this was a new job that Caesar had just created. Uh, and so eventually, Right, the, the emperor had total control over declaring war, right, or not declaring war, enacting new laws, right? He could do it all on his own. He could stop any legal action, so he could pop in and say, uh, nope, this trial is over, right? You win, you lose. Um, and he was not subject to any of the laws. There was no distinction between the finances of the empire and that of the emperor, right? Um, I think that's a myth. Its finances and those of the emperor, uh, right? So, whatever Rome had, the emperor had, and the emperor was the commander in chief of the Roman army, so pretty much controlled everything in the state in the in the empire. Right? And that came in handy, right? If somebody, if it looked like somebody was trying to right wrangle to kill him or somehow take over, he could just send them off to war, say, "Okay, go fight," right? In Britain, right? Go fight in Britain. And uh, then that person wouldn't be a problem anymore. But wherever there's power, right, there's struggles for power. And so there was still palace intrigue. You were less worried about another um, a political rival, like, a, you know, another tribune or something assassinating you or a senator or something like that. But now all the sons of the emperor, right, as they're waiting, wondering if they're going to who's going to be emperor next, they start sort of killing each other and fighting with each other. Also, the emperor had this uh, private army called the Praetorian Guard, the, sorry, Praetorian Guard, that's the picture from here. Um, they got involved in some of the assassinations, right, because they were armed and very close to the emperor. So if you could get the Praetorian Guard on your side, uh, you could maybe get an emperor assassinated and get your preferred guy in there. Um, and so, you know, while things were good and peaceful and economic and good economically, uh, then sure, the empire, the, the position of emperor is flourishing. But all it kind of took was a little economic slump in the third century A.D. to to get all these lurking problems of intrigue and assassination and emperor after emperor being killed or right deposed um, to get started going. And then all of a sudden it's getting to be as chaotic as the late empire, or sorry, as the late republic. So, the emperor was very powerful, but a single person alone cannot hold an empire together. What really held the empire together was the economy, right? And that was, uh, that's always been the engine of Rome. Now, it was not a planned economy, right? It was not thought out, designed, top down, it really just happened sort of ad hoc, like at the moment, right, whatever is working at the moment, we'd start with that, build on to it, and so on. So, it, you know, back in this time, it was impressive, and the public works and things were impressive, but it was still basically an agricultural society. So, yeah, there were precious metals, and there was some kind of technology, but the primary good that's being traded around and creating wealth is food, right? Rich people are still 
farmers, right? They're just very rich farmers. Uh, so the right to own land, right? The conquest of land, and then the power over slaves to work the land. This is what you need for economic advancement. That's how you get rich. It's land and produce. And this whole area, right? This whole Mediterranean area is engaged in that. And the way Rome got rich off of this is taxation, right? So there were taxes on your land, right? Property taxes. People were taxed. Inheritance was taxed. Imports were taxed. Exports were taxed, right? Everywhere there's some sort of economics exchange or something of value, Rome's taking their little piece. Uh, as you can imagine, in the ancient world, collecting taxes is a nightmare, right? Uh, you don't have a centralized computer system. It's very easy to evade taxes, right? So you have to have a huge workforce of people um, out there making sure that everyone is counted, right? Census is a big thing. If you remember, right, in the Bible, when, right, Jesus goes to Bethlehem, there's supposed, it's supposedly because there's a big census. This is Roman times, right? Um, it's probably not the case in the Bible story. They have everybody going to the town that their parents were born or something, which sounds insane. So that's probably not how it works, certainly not how it worked, right? But um, at any rate, yeah, you can imagine like, yeah, keeping track of people and then having people out there finding the farms, right? And getting the money or the produce or whatever they undertaking. And it had to be done because that's how Rome survived. Um, feeding the Roman Empire was another huge undertaking. So the city of Rome was about a million people at that time, right? So that's big. I was, I lived in San Antonio when I was a kid. And, and when I moved away from San Antonio, it was a million people right? It's the size of a decently large uh, modern city. And uh, so you can't feed a million people just on the local farmland around Rome, right? So you need constant trade with farther away areas. You need conquest, right? To bring in money, slaves, produce. So uh, most of the grain that fed Rome came from Africa, Sicily, Sardinia, and Egypt. You also had to feed the Roman army which was huge right and again these were professional soldiers that would be gone for months and years on end right and you had to feed them and they ate a lot because they marched all day and fought all the time and they had to be well fed if they're starving uh you, you're not gonna have a good army um so all of that food had to come from further away from gaul like germany the danube region balkan states um which were um so Soldiers were also paid in money, and that money came from tax revenue from all over the empire. So again, you need that, all that, all those people to collect those taxes. So, um, for the most part, right, subjects of Rome, the people they conquered, benefited from being integrated into this huge economic engine. So you had access to all sorts of things you ne wouldn't necessarily have had before if you were just a member of a a tribe in Gaul, right? So you could get olive oil, right? Now you have Roman traders going to and from. They want your grain, right? And they'll bring you something in exchange. You could get some olive oil. You could get some Roman wine. Uh, tiled roofs, as I said, Romans, when they started the colony, they would start these, right, construction projects and, and there would be all sorts of public works. Um, having a tiled roof was a huge deal back then because houses burned down all the time. And uh, here's this a picture of a Roman villa, right? And so the tiled roof, much less flammable. And as I mentioned, right, the Romans did a huge amount of construction and it allowed the conquered peoples, or, or at the very least the rich ones, to feel like they were part of something great. So if you're, you know, higher up in, a, again, a, a tribe in Gaul, um, it doesn't mean you live all that much differently than, than a peasant, but if you've got now you've got these Roman luxuries coming in. You see what these Roman villas are like. Now you're starting to see what it's really like to live sort of high on the hog, right? So uh, it's attractive, as we say, a seductive culture. They, as I mentioned the grid plan, right? That was mimicking the Greek cities uh, in Italy. They built these huge triumphal arches, aqueducts. So here's a picture of an aqueduct that's still standing. Many of these are still standing across Europe. So they would transport water, right? It's like plumbing pipe. They would uh, ran across these bridges that went from places of 
you know, a lake at a higher elevation down to the lower elevations, but they could transport water hundreds of miles. Um, they had sewer systems, public baths, sports facilities. Uh, the town of Bath in England has still has a Roman bath back from when England was, was Roman. Yeah, all over Europe, you can find, still find these because they're really well constructed. Another important part of Roman culture was the idea of the law. Again, they were sort of a an empire of lawyers, right? And they thought of the law as a natural outgrowth of human reason. Um, again, there was largely a folk law, but they, that's because they thought that law is just rational. Any human, right, with a brain can figure out what the law should be, right? Don't steal, don't murder, and so on. Um, and this sort of larger legal structure gives you a certain sense of security that's not going to be available in some of these uh, further away towns. So if you are a villager, right, in a, outside the Roman Empire, pretty much at any moment, right, a raider on horseback, I, mean, I may have mentioned them before, can swoop into your town, start killing people, take all your stuff, right, take your, the women often, right, right away. From the beginning of agricultural society, this has been a problem, right, these raiders on horseback, swoop in, take all your stuff, and, and, and flee. If you're a Roman, right, you've got more security, there's less likely that that's going to happen. So it's nice to leave, live in a police state sometime, right? Um, okay, and, uh, also, art, literature, science, higher education, all funded, encouraged in the Roman Empire. You really start to feel like you're in a civilization. Uh, yeah, it's attractive, and they didn't have to, uh, for a long, in many areas, have a huge military presence to keep people happy, right? The Roman Empire kept people happy. So their religion is, was also kind of helpful in their expansion, right? They were polytheists. Uh, and as were most of the people they conquered, apart from the Jews, right? So again, the, the new beginning of the New Testament, right? And the story of Jesus, that all happens among some Jews in Rome. And there was tension there because the Jews were monotheistic and the Romans were not. But in most other areas, yeah, it was polytheists conquering polytheists. And you had your gods, they had their gods. Your gods can join our gods. We can all worship all the gods. It's not a problem, right? We're, we have some different uh, gods, right, that, that the Romans, they took definitely a bunch of their gods came from the Greeks, right, they just borrowed them, so Zeus becomes Jupiter, right, Athena becomes Minerva, and so on. They had no problem just incorporating Greek gods into their religion. Uh, they took Egyptian gods on board, um, a little harder, right, to bring the Jewish god on board, because according to the Jews, he's the only god, right, so you can't just say, okay, your god's one of ours. Well, no, that's that's not how we see it, say the Jews. There's only one of them, right? So that was tense. And then, of course, as Christianity began to develop and become more popular, that's another tension. Uh, we'll see that tension a great deal in the film we watch, Agora. Um, and it's interesting to, to see that happen. Uh, that's one of the major things. But, you know, Christianity had a lot of Roman and Greek influence into it by as it developed, right? By the time you get to like Paul and stuff working out Christian doctrine, um, they really were thinking sort of more philosophically and, and were influenced by Roman and Greek philosophy. And uh, there were certain points of compatibility between this universal, single universal God and this single universal empire, right? There's a sort of um, kind of compatibility in spirit. And that's eventually exactly what happens, right? Um, the one God becomes the God of the one empire and Rome is a Christian empire. So the, the Western Roman Empire, which is that Mediterranean Empire, lasted until about uh, the 400s. Uh, but you could already see around the 200s that things were starting to slow down. So they had stopped expanding for the most part. And... Expansion was kind of important, right? They have, there's a lot of mouths to feed. Um, they needed fresh influx of wealth, right? Uh, resources, slaves, um, for this upward mobility of the lower middle classes to keep going, for this to keep pumping. So 
If they're stopping expanding, that means their economy is going to be contracted. And this wealthy empire, right, is just kind of sitting there not being aggressive militarily. Well, people outside the boundaries are going to start to see these rich cities and start to try to raid it on its borders, start to pick away at the edges, right? Sometimes, um, and all that, right, all those raids on the border means that the emperor and some of the important people in Rome have to divert their attention to deal with that stuff. And so, again, important people are leaving Rome to go fight on the frontiers and so on. Threatening trade routes, right, that are important to the economy and so on. So these raids get to start to get more and more serious and begin to be more and more debilitating. So in 212 AD, Rome granted citizenship to all male non-slaves in the entire empire, right? Originally, citizen was, citizenship was this coveted prize, right, that you would work for, or you could serve in the military for like decades to finally get, and now just everybody gets it. Right? So the hope was, if we give everybody citizenship, then everyone's got a stake in this thing, and it's going to help strengthen the empire. Um, it also meant more people we can draft into military service, right? More taxes can be uh, levied. And the idea also was to make Roman religion uniform right throughout the empire. Um, you know, it was affected, effective to a point. Of course, it didn't go, the, the religion part didn't go down well with the, with the Jews and the Christians. And ultimately, you know, it was a, a doomed strategy. It was sort of a, a last ditch attempt from an empire that was on the way down. So by about by the 200s now, Christianity is starting to get fairly popular you know, with the lower classes, right? If you know anything about Christianity, you know, blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, right? So it's um, it is uh, attractive to people that don't have a lot of money, right? It says you're important, right? You'll have a place in heaven, and this message of brotherly love and respect for the lower classes uh, started to it started to spread like wildfire. Um, at first. Christians were persecuted by the Romans, so they were, um, you know, stories of the Romans being fed to the lions or whatever. I mean, they're to a degree true, right? They, they, there were Christians, and, and often those became the early martyrs of the Christian church. Um, the persecution, right, as Christianity became more and more popular, uh, the persecution was finally ended in 311, and then a mere one year later, right, Emperor Constantine dreamt that he ought to display a cross in order to win the bot his next day's battle and said, okay. So he displays the cross, he wins the battle, and he says, okay, that's good enough for me, right? I'm going to convert to Christianity. Then Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. Um, so Christianity is not like these other religions that they were perfectly compatible with, right? Christianity is monotheistic. So now if the empire, empire is monotheistic, it means all these other polytheists, right, can't just coexist happily, right? Uh, so the temples of the pagan gods torn down, and eventually Christianity becomes the dominant religion sort of in actual practice as well as in the law. So big transformation right, from a relatively loose, open attitude towards religion that served them well for a while, now to the point towards the end of the empire when they're looking for stability and a single religion is sort of help to accentuate that stability. So Constantine, the same one that converted to Christianity, moved the capital, uh, the Roman Empire, away from Rome and moved to Constantinople, which is in Turkey now. It's now called Istanbul, right? 324 AD. Uh, and Rome, the city of Rome was sacked over and over, eventually captured by the by the Visigoths in 410. And that's that's our the date we slap on the end of the the Western Roman Empire. And that was actually a you know a slower, more chaotic disintegration, right? But 410, good enough for us, right? That's the end of the Western Roman Empire. It's just this constant assault on its borders. Um, they tried to make alliances with these tribes. That really only made the problem worse because that was just seen as weakness. And so, right, the 
Germanic tribes would say, okay, well, yeah, we'll sign a treaty with you, you know, give us whatever million dollars. And then as soon as they got the money, they just attack again, whatever. It just, it, it wasn't. Right. So eventually it just sort of didn't so much fall as kind of dis disaggregate. So some areas were conquered by enemies. Others technically remained Roman, but there just wasn't really a connected empire right around them. Um, and there wasn't any real centralized control anymore. And, you know, as that goes away, a lot of the benefits go away too, right? The cheap olive, cheap olive oil and the tiled roofs are no longer available either. And it's not clear at a certain point what's the point of being a Roman citizen anywhere or calling yourself Roman. Um, the economic engine has collapsed.